Welcome to Fresh One, the BD Outdoors podcast brought to you by the Coronado Brewing Company. Stay coastal. All right, guys, we're here today. I'm joined by um, my coworker, Nate Winicki, over to yo, my yo. left. And we've got a special guest, uh, Mr. Howie Stretch from Newport Vessels. What's up, guys? Stoked to have you here. Thanks for coming. Stoked to be here. Yeah, man. Um, so I think kind of just to get started, I'd love to hear... I know we were talking about a little bit before we started rolling here, but just a little bit more about your background and how you got into the fishing industry, the kayak industry, and then maybe a little bit of, about your experience with Newport Vessels this uh, these past couple months. Yeah. Um, man, I mean, I think like a lot of us, I owe it all to my dad getting mm-hmm. me into fishing, and it started out like I think everybody's got a similar path kind of toward either becoming a passionate angler or or even somebody who's just in their adulthood casually enjoying fishing but like I started out you know catching spotties under the Ingram Street Bridge and um when I was like three you know fishing the <laughs> bays and stuff and then then kind of graduated out to the half day boats and at the time crazy sand bass fishing you know sand bass was like the big deal um, so just fishing plastics and stuff, catching sand bass on the flats and in Newport. And we'd drive all up and down the coast, you know, hopping sport boats. And when the bite would get hot, my dad, he, he'd go, hey, uh, I got to get you out of school early. We're going to go <laughs> catch the boat or something, you know. So we'd fish fish twilight half day and then eventually three-quarter day overnight stuff. And um, and I was, ke- I was, I was always bugging him from – the time I was just like a tiny grom until he finally let me join him but I think probably about starting at about six years old I was I would always say hey when are you gonna take me tuna fishing when you I want to go tuna fishing I want to go tuna fishing and so finally we had good good yellowfin kelp fishing and he was I was like bugging him and bugging him and bugging him this this good spell kind of drug on and so finally he's like okay you can come with me so my first tuna trip I woke up gray light you know they had glassed up a kelp and uh I think it was probably the time before the like they the, they weren't using beacons or anything I think they were yeah they were just glassing them up and uh so I woke up like rolled out of the bunk room and just it was just on dude and I caught probably eight yellowfin my first deal and then I was just from that point forward I was just addicted to tuna fishing so then kind of fast forward you know into my freshman year of college uh in high school I had coached a little bit and stuff then I I was like you know end of my freshman year of college I was needing to get a job and work for the summer and uh so so a little bit ahead of the end of the year I had reached out and this is the time where you know, fishing season, offshore fishing season didn't start until July. This was like after 4th of July until the end of October. That was the season, you know. I mean, we're so spoiled now, but, but, uh, so I started calling around captains and, and I was a little ahead of the time where, you know, the captains start going, oh, we need some crew. We need some crew for this season. And I don't know if, you know, Jim and Joe are going to be like, who knows what's up with them they've been MIA since the end of October <laughs> last year and uh, so I kind of got ahead of the ball and started calling some six-pack um, owner operators and um, started working for J- Jock on the Keokai, um when I was 18 and worked for him for about a season and a half and then it wasn't enough work and so uh, at the time he was actually running the boat springtime we were doing sea bass and yellow island stuff out of newport and then uh in like june july he'd move the boat down to dana landing and uh at the time tom had a boat at uh seaforth landing that he was just moving over to dana landing so we, for a half a season we shared a dock with him and i would always chat with him and and the guys you know his crew there and stuff and and so anyways after after about a season and a half working for Jock, I hopped on with Tom, and I was like, yeah, I want to work full-time, you know? And so starting in about April 1st through the end of October into November, um, 
you know, until school was out, I'd work Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday with Tom. And then when the summer, uh, when, when we got out in May for summer break, I worked every freaking day of the season. And I think, you know, I would do, even when I was in college, I was doing a hundred plus days on the water with him. And, and that kind of just, I think jump started my, like, for me, it validated, okay, I've got a spot in this industry. This is, this is kind of my, these are my, this is my kind of springboard into the fishing industry. And so, um, and I didn't know if that meant running a boat forever or, I mean, when I, when I started out, I was fully zoned on, I'm going to be an owner operator. That's what I want to do in, in this industry. And, and then as I got five, six years in, I kind of got a little fried and I was, you know, I wanted a family eventually and all that stuff. And that lifestyle is tough, you know? So I kind of took a little hiatus from fishing, stepped away, tried some other stuff, um, you know, dabbled in trying to own my own business. And as a 20 something year old, it was just too many distractions and it it was tough, you know? And so I kind of came back to, um, kind of came back to my roots, did a little bit of coaching, um, it did a little bit of kind of like fill in stuff on some boats and, and, uh, so then eventually, you know, my dad's friend, he was one of Hobie's biggest accounts and he owned a, a Hobie dealership in out of Lake Havasu. He was retiring. And anyways, he had, he had heard through the grapevine through Morgan actually that they needed a parts and accessories product manager for Hobie kayaks and and so anyways I was referred to Hobie by one of my dad's best friends and interviewed and kind of like I feel like that interview that first interview with Morgan was kind of like my our introduction to our friendship with one another <laughs> and you know a couple weeks went by and he called me and he said hey we'd like to offer you this position for Morgan we, interviewed you. He's yeah. the one that did your interview. Uh huh. Oh wow. We'd like to offer you this position for way too little money, and I said I'm in. <laughs> Sold. <laughs> um, but and then yeah, man, it's just you know I've just been committed and dedicated to to fishing my entire life, and I I've, I've always known this is what I'm gonna do. Um, you know, and when you're going to work doing something you enjoy, it's it, you know it's not that big of a drag. You just there's. Yeah. So, so you cool. growing up, you weren't exclusively obviously fishing off kayaks and stuff. Cause I know no. at this point in time, like for those of you who, who don't know, Morgan, um, prominence and, and Adam Traubman were in on a podcast, uh, last year and they're really good friends with Howie. And for, uh, you know, lack of a better word, these guys are experts in the kayak fishing field, um, and, oh, geez. and kayaking in general, you yeah. know? Um, so it's curious to hear how, you know, that you kind of got into that a little bit later which was still the very forefront of kayak fishing really exploding, you know? Totally. I mean, I dabbled with paddling and uh, fishing off kayaks. Like my dad had a boat in Quivira Basin. So we, you know, we, he had a couple just old, like Costco or Walmart kayaks or something sitting on the, on the bat, on the cockpit of the boat. And so we'd paddle those out and go fish the bridge and stuff. But, um, so I dabbled with it a little bit fished it on the lake I grew up in, uh, you know, kind of dabbling a little bit here and there with kayak fishing, did bass stuff. And, um, but it wasn't really, I wasn't, I wasn't really fired up about it. Paddling a shitty kayak and trying to fight current (laughs) and fish. It's tough. It's not that fun. I was going to ask that, you know, so (laughs) kayak fishing to me, it seems like it's taken a long time to get to the point that it is now where it's a very, enjoyable experience from the very get-go like totally in the beginnings like when was it that you started really putting in effort to make this whole kayak fishing experience almost or even better than a boat like was there a specific moment or was was it just a i think it an was overall an, thing yeah i think it was a natural evolution of the industry um but you know drawing off of my experience paddling a crappy kayak and trying to fish effectively then experiencing what it was like to fish off of a modern Hobie kayak like I really I really got into kayak fishing heavily 
when I started working at Hobie. Hmm. I was only able to really insert myself pretty seamlessly because of my background. And uh, I think that's a common misconception that people have about me is that I was, I've been kayak fishing forever. It was really something that Morgan introduced me to. You know, I started, started working for, for him at Hobie. And uh, I think the first week I was there, he's like, yeah, let's go, let's go kayak fish this weekend. Um, we'll go, let's go fish tabletops. So, you know, that was kind of, that was like, that was my first surf launch and I'd surfed and stuff growing up. And so I wasn't too intimidated by the surf launch, but there's a little channel at tabletops, but when there's surf, it's not the easiest launch. You know, you have to, like, you have to have your, your wits about you with going in and out of the surf and stuff. And I'm lucky that I had that experience going in and out of the surf because that's a huge learning curve for people. <laughs> Nobody stories. Pe- people don't know what to do. It's like never owning a boat. Mm. And the first time you pull up to the lawn tramp, you're yep. like, well, yeah, I, yeah I can back this thing. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, no problem. I see yeah. everyone else do it. Like, no problem. Yeah. yeah. And then, you, you know, and then you see those are like the qualified captain moments. But, but yeah, so that was like, this was 2016. I got fired up on kayak fishing after that one session. You know, I was still, I was primarily tuna fishing at that, up to that point. So we're going to fish the kelp line at, in Solana Beach for sea bass and yellows and stuff. And I was still fishing mono and, you know, Morgan was probably looking at me like, oh, no, this <laughs> like but so anyways, he let me borrow a, one of his setups with a, you know, filled with 65 pound spectra and like you have to fish when you're fishing in the kelp and um, you know, I took like 10 minutes to tie a uni to uni and onto my spectra. And it was just like, I was a little nervous cause I kind of knew who Morgan was. I did my research, you know, and, um, uh, first five minutes out there, I hooked a, a good size sea bass or yellow or oh, something no on way. the kayak. And he's like, he's, <laughs> he's probably like, you son of a gun. But, <laughs> um, and yeah, the thing like, took me down into some structure and broke me off and I was I let some words fly and you know he was I think that was kind of our bonding moment where um you know so Morgan and I worked a lot together but first and foremost we're friends you know and so it's all he's still my main fishing partner up to this point you work specifically on like the product development side of things yeah for yeah so I I was on the team that designed and and brought to market watercraft and then also um kind of i spearheaded a lot of the accessory product development could have done so much more but you know with the resources we had Mm -hmm. i'm pretty proud of what i did at hobie yeah i mean it's it's incredible honestly to see how far those kayaks have come (laughs) yeah i mean the thing is there you can you can have never kayaked before in your life and people's main concern who aren't experienced everybody wants to kayak fish if you're interested in fishing you want to try kayak fishing it's like the next step from getting off the bank mm-hmm. and it and it's there's this appeal to it because you're you're silent you're close to the water catching big fish like there's just certain appeal to it and everybody wants to do it but there's this mental block that people have like oh is it gonna tip or you know can you and really like, catch a big fish on that little tiny thing, yeah. you know? And, and yeah. it, that, it doesn't matter, dude. Like you could, you can easily catch 150 to 200 pound tuna on a kayak. You can, because you become a float. Like, you know, you become a long line buoy, essentially. The thing <laughs> swims you around until yep. it's tired out and then you get up and down on the fish and you know, honestly, dude, you, you can, you can put yellows in the boat way faster on a kayak than you can on a boat. So you're winding yourself to the fish, then you're up and down on them. And when you put the heat on them, it's done. So that makes sense. Huh? So, I mean, like I'm thinking coming from, you know, six pack charters on some pretty, you know, nice boats going to this little tiny, um, vessel, you know, uh, what was the, the difference in just overall experience? Like was, do you think that played into getting you so fired up? 
is that all of a sudden you're like a part of the environment you know you're totally. quiet you're right next to the water oh dude all that yeah yeah that that's that was the biggest draw for me i mean i was i had always being you know holding a captain's license running a, a six-pack boat and you know most people look up to that i looked up to these guys catching big yellows and sea bass out of the kayak i wanted to do that hmm. i wanted to be that guy doing that and uh you know just there's a sense of adventure that comes with kayak fishing you don't get from a boat you know everything's pretty controlled with a boat you know you have all these constants you've got either a launch ramp or a dock you're tied up to you yeah. back the thing out you pull out you go get bait at the receiver you go out the jetty and you kind of you know set up on your spot whatever there's a lot more a lot more variables that change with kayak fishing and you know number one getting yourself out through the surf is mm is cool and then you know just you can hear everything you're right next to the water it's kind of like catching big giant fish out of a float tube like you're almost just doing battle hand to hand with these things and so yeah you hear you hear everything that's going on you're kind of immersed in the environment I, that's like the part that just did it, it just it seems like such more of an intimate experience than totally. if you're on for a skiff sure. yeah you and, tune um, into that like the na nature element exactly and, and when we had morgan and adam on i think other nate brought up a really good point on that podcast where he said um it makes you almost more aware of your surroundings you know totally. because you are hearing you're you're using your senses so much more than if you were just on a skiff you know um and you don't have the ability to go run like a half mile to that spot of fish like you're really trying to dial in your zone and and make sure that you're going to be able to capitalize on whatever opportunities presented to you you are yeah you are much more of an opportunistic angler you know at that point and you're soaking in every little signal because you're right you don't have the luxury of running two five ten miles to a different spot you have to it's a very strategic you know um adventure every time you every time you set out to fish for example if i go fish la jolla in the summertime or getting into august september that water warms up and that bait moves away from the kelp line it it just you have so so you go you, okay i gotta go i gotta pedal three miles to the pier to make bait and then i gotta come back that's like a two and a half hour ordeal right there so then you start thinking you start going backtracking okay I, if i want to be in the bite zone at gray light then i gotta launch at 3 30 in the morning <laughs> yeah right and it gets insane and i gotta go to the pier and the bait's gonna be on the lights and under the pier i'm gonna do that that's gonna be two and a half hours to go do that and come back and then i'm gonna focus on this area and you you pick stuff apart and if you're if you're observant about things like i feel like it just speeds up your learning process a ton absolutely you know you start to approach these big features in the in the ocean like you would uh, approach a a point or a high spot in a lake you know and you kind of depending on the current all this different stuff there's like it's not a, a spot it's like corners of a spot and when you get experienced operating a big boat, it's the same thing, you know, it's like, okay, one side of this piece of structure might be good on this current and mm -hmm. wind and whatever. And then on this other condition, this one side of the structure is going to bite. But yeah, you just slow down, you pick stuff apart a lot more. And, and when you, like, if you are willing to pay attention to the signals, you can like really really speed up your learning curve definitely yeah it's, yeah it's pretty sick i mean my kayak experience at least fishing wise very limited yeah. <laughs> i have done a couple of like bay trips i've gone up to like the eastern sierra and done some trout fishing but like the the standout experience i have was uh down in bay of la actually so it was this last summer and it was so cool because we had finished up on the ponga it was kind of a scratchy day of yellowtail fishing it was super windy 
wind blew all day long. So we were bouncing from spot to spot, like you're saying, you know, trying or whatever. We come on back, I eat some some lunch, and then the wind completely dies. And the whole bay turns into like a sheet of glass. Mm. Oh. And it was the most insane condition we had had all week. So I go down, and I'm staying at this place that rents out these little, like, just like like 12 foot kayak it's probably like 10 years old you know i mean it was this little just the dinky piece of, of bottle, plastic man. right yeah and i was like yo how much you know to rent these out they're like ten dollars i'm like deal so i give them 10 bucks probably, I, you. probably <laughs> honestly i i should have bartered i should have been like nah five but but listen so it it was worth it in the end because i launch out there i take my one little spinning rod with a little sp minnow jerk bait because I, I look around and there's bait everywhere in the bay. You see yeah. them and there's just rippling all over. And it yeah. was such a beautiful condition. It oh. was like super easy to pick them apart. So I'm casting through all these bait balls. I'm catching nothing, catching nothing. And I can't go far, right? Because I have this one little tiny paddle, yeah. you know? So I'm kind of moving up and down the beach. The sun's going down. And I'm, I'm like about to like go back into the bank and I see this fat bait ball like right in front of the hotel. I cast through it. I give it like one whack with my uh, with my my rod, and it goes boom, dude. I get smoked, <laughs> like I have never gotten bit before on on a jerk bait. Like it hit this thing, peels me around, and it might have bust me off if I wasn't on the yak because I start totally. getting towed by it. And like talking <laughs> about a float, I'm like freaking out because I thought this was just like you know a cool little sunset experience, you know, and like. Being out there, it's amazing because you're right next to the water. You can see all the stuff around you, you know. And now all of a sudden, I'm getting towed by what I think is a yellowtail because what else lives there, right? Yeah. And and I'm whining, I'm whining, I'm yarding on this thing, like trying to pull it up, and it comes up and it's got this chrome and purple head, and it's like 15 pounds, and I start freaking because I think I just hooked a freaking sea bass. <clears throat> so I'm like, I'm pulling on it, I'm like. Like trying to like calm myself down and everything, and I didn't have a gaff, I didn't have a net, I yeah, had nothing. So, <laughs> dude, so I'm just like I'm seeing it, and I'm freaking out. I'm like, oh my god, dude, like white sea bass for sure. And I'm whining on it. It comes up, it goes back down, comes up, goes back down. Finally, it like chills out, comes right next to me. I I just gill that thing, put it in the boat, and it has these vampire teeth in it. Oh yeah, it was an orange mouth corvina, dude, and it was like 15 pounds, yeah, dude. Made my whole trip. But kayak fishing, just like that, it was such an amazing experience. And, you know, having a pro angler from Hobie would have made that experience way better. But at the same time, I don't know if I would have been able to do that from shore because I had such light line. Oh, totally. And the ability for that that fish to tow me around really played a lot with, you know, like, Big time. you know, just keeping everything chill and not over over stressing my stuff. So Big it was time. cool. And I've it was got- an amazing experience. That, that's yeah, impressive. That's, that's yeah. I mean that that paints a picture of like the the draw of kayak fishing. Yeah, for sure. Exactly. I've got some big plans of things I want to do off the kayak this year, and they involve it involves flying gaffs and floats. Oh boy! Yeah. But we'll see. TBD. If, if TBD. the opportunity presents itself, <laughs> yeah. I. Th- it's been a. <clears throat> ever since we hooked a, a yummy flyer fish, and handed it off to. Kevin in the kayak. No way. And, and then got the spectra. That fish got run over, right? Yeah, the spectra got run over. So ever oh. since ever <laughs> since that moment, I'm like, somebody's got to put a local cow on a kayak. I know it sounds nuts. I think Morgan's and, racing you for that And one. it is nuts. So it hasn't happened yet. No one's caught a nope. certified cow on, on a kayak. kayak. No, not around here. In, <laughs> in, uh, in the Mediterranean, there's that dudes would be that, insane. Dude, there's dudes that, that put fish over 200 pounds on all, every year on the kayak really yeah i would like wouldn't even begin to think about how you even land that fish well i think you just gotta I'm be saying, patient yeah you know you let you it tow gotta, you around yeah. get, get, once you get up and down on it you can do it you can the thing is getting it on the boat and something like a a pro angler could handle it you could pull it up onto the back deck and there's enough capacity on that kayak to to do it but you could also use like a, a ski sled, you know, like uh, yeah. a tow-in sled, or you could um, use a flying gaff and a float and just watch the float and then go collect your fish and have it on a, you know, get it somehow onto the kayak, onto the sled, or onto a boat if you had one nearby. Make sure you have a bat. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah, hope that thing's done well, by the time. Have you seen that video? I think the guy had a yellow fin right next on his yak, basically. Oh, he's like and he gaffed it, backwards. and he's trying to like. I don't know what he's trying to do. Maybe lift it onto his yak, but the thing was hot, and it starts going, and it acts like a motor, and he starts going backwards. <laughs> Did he started doing like 15, like 15, 15, in 10, 15 miles an hour, I've and seen this that. this tuna is like fully propelling him. It's, it's funny. Yeah, it's, it, dude, so. it's that's the adventure. I of, yeah. I think this is a great transition into. I'd love to hear you know a little bit about uh, about Newport, and as we transition from maybe like more freshwater and lakes, kind of small water um bodies of water into the saltwater scene where you're having to cover miles um you know you mentioned it'll take two and a half hours in a pedal kayak to go make bait and then even get in the zone yep um and how electric motors have kind of made their way into the kayak scene into the you know yacht tender scene totally and how useful they really are like there are so many fisheries where it's advantageous to have a smaller boat as nice as it is to have an 80 foot viking you know like there's certain fisheries especially in the skinny water or you know somewhere where you have to be stealthy that being in a smaller vessel whether it's a tender or, or a kayak is so advantageous and then on the stealth theme like having an electric motor that's quiet you know but you're going to be able to go an appropriate speed you know from from point a to point b totally yeah you think you think you can maintain a, a certain pedaling cadence or something or or paddling even that to where you can do a consistent four and a half miles an hour you can't <laughs> you just can't not especially when you factor in current and stuff a lot of times um but uh but yeah on the newport side you know like so just a little background on newport the the founder uh newport was founded in 2011 and uh since then you know their kind of introduction in, into the market was inflatable tenders so that ship to shore market and then into trolling motors and we've we're working on uh 150,000 trolling motor sales and wow. we've you know for a long time we've had these inflatable boats that that have been on the market and then there was this opportunity to get into kayak fishing and this whole electric outboard movement. And, you know, the founders at Newport saw that and thought this is a perfect opportunity to kind of like become a leader in this electric outboard movement. And of course, then around that same time frame, you know, adding electric outboard power to kayaks was validated through this this uprising of kayak tournament fishing and you know there's this huge debate around is kayak fishing with an electric outboard kayak fishing and my response to that is it's not traditional kayak fishing i love the exercise of kayak fishing and the the human propulsion aspect but when money's on the line and you're competing and you're trying to cover as much water as possible as fast as you can and compete at the top level you know that was kind of that was kind of the sh the moment where what kayak fishing is shifted into this acceptance of of like adding electric motors onto onto the back of your kayak and um you know it it's just all these dudes who validated and women who validated adding electric mo uh, outboard motors to kayaks kind of through this tournament scene they all started out paddling before they were pedaling and pedaling before they were adding outboards and like this is this is in that way part of the roots of the sport like has it evolved of course it's evolved everything's evolved look at look at any watercraft that's used for fishing since the beginning of, beginning of time it's been a constant evolution like if somebody said this isn't fishing because you're you know fishing out of a yacht with 2000 horsepower turbo <laughs> yeah, diesel right yeah like it's just a it's just a joke like i think 
it, it it still is kayak fishing you still get that that essence of like being immersed in the natural element it's you know these electric outboards are they've come a long way from a trolling motor but they're silent like they're super quiet they're you're still getting that you know audible like connection with nature and all that stuff um and so yeah is it traditional kayak ca kayak fishing no it's not not by any means it's an evolved version of kayak fishing and so and and it opens up access yeah, to, to that's fishing. a huge thing it opens up access to to the ability to fish for all these different kinds of people of varying physical abilities and and stuff totally you know? and, and i yeah. Well, I also don't think it's it's not a black and white thing. No. It's not that you either motorized or you're totally not. Like if you have a motor, but then you get into your zone, you can pedal around and still totally. be, you know, like how you always were. This is just a tool to get you out to the zone and to get you back safely. Totally. And to reduce time and overall effort. I mean, I'm, I'm big on the safety. Yeah. Huge on the safety. It's aspect. a little. It's a little peace of mind. Little cushion. Absolutely. Little peace of mind. Yeah. You know, I mean, if you physically tire out and need to rely on a motor oh, to get yeah. back you've got it or you know even just from a a tactical approach of the the body of water you're fishing definitely there's zones that are off limits because it's too far you know and and the concern is can i get myself out and can i get myself back before it gets dark or even under my own physical human capacity or whatever that's the biggest fear yeah, i think a lot of people have or at least i do you know of going offshore in a kayak is like what if i can't make it back it sounds like a good idea and when you're out there <laughs> oh man yeah it's kind of spooky it you is know? but you just have to be smart and um use a vhf radio wear a life jacket stay tethered to your you know key fob to your motor and fish with somebody like yeah. for sure yeah, and you're, I can imagine. Sorry, you're exposed like crazy out there. I feel like most people are going to be using it as that kind of hybrid style. Like that's the best way to use it. For instance, you know, you're not going to be able to have your electric motor during your surf launch. You know, you're going to be pedaling through that. Yeah, um, not all the time. Yeah, not all the time, but sometimes you it's, can it's, if it's flat gonna, enough. Yeah, you know, yeah. on a on a on a super nice day, like certainly, dude, put that thing in the water and get going. Um, and I'd love to, I know, Nate, you have some experience with the NT300, right? I do. I'd love to hear yeah. about that. Um, you know, I don't know if I can talk about it, but we, we recently, you know, shot some, some footage for the NK180 Pro, which is just kind of the uh, improved version of the yeah, NK180. Yeah, that's fair game, because I think this will go live after it's Perfect. Launched, but, <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I just, I, I have my experience with that, and then and <laughs> I know you fished on this, on the uh, inflatable with the... Yeah, I got, I got a story about the NT300. <laughs> um, <laughs> it, it's got some balls to it. That thing yeah. can push you around. So. Yeah, it's impressive. Uh, if it's you've impressive. ever driven an electric car, yeah. you understand the like oh, yeah. the, the thrust. And the torque. You, yeah, the, the torque. So when you turn the the tiller handle like it goes okay so <laughs> we were doing this shoot for the for newport we're on we're on uh san diego bay and i was pretty excited because i'm going with a guy that i've looked up to for a while uh eric risen who was like a bay guide and this was my first time like actually like fishing with him you know so i was pretty stoked so we kind of separated i was on eric was actually nice enough to bring down his little like 12 foot uh, aluminum boat or a little skiff, you know, and then we put the NT300 on that, Black and that magic. was like, yeah, yeah, and that was sick. Like, he <laughs> takes it up to the Eastern Sierra and does, you know, trout fishing yeah. and stuff. So, I think, how you were on your kayak, and then we had like another boat or something. <clears throat> so, I get a general rundown, you know, turn left for reverse, turn right to go forward <laughs> in the middle to stop, and I'm like, that's easy. So, we launch, right? And I kind of put out, and I turn it on. I'm like, all right, let's go over to the dock. It's about 10 feet away. 15 feet away i go rain and it goes boom and i start <laughs> shooting like 15 miles an hour straight for the dock and i'm like oh no so i go the other way nothing happens and i'm still going very fast in eric's little skiff i go full speed into to uh <laughs> up on top of into one of the your kayaks friggin', no on your kayak dude <laughs> i smoked your kayak right on the freaking dock was he in I, it? that's fine no, no he no. wasn't even I was there like, yet parking a trailer or something. <laughs> you should have seen my face i thought i just like killed somebody i was like 
white. I was like, oh my god. Because I smashed into your kayak. Not only did I potentially damage Eric's boat, but I see your fish finder go boop into the water. And I'm like, oh my god. We haven't even started fishing yet. So I'm like trying to like handle it you know like put everything back on be like no this is chill <laughs> eric happened here yeah eric is like dude you okay and i'm like yes i'm fine and i swear to god i know how to drive a boat but <laughs> they give me a more thorough walkthrough yeah. of the nt300 being like yeah you got to be careful with it because it has power yeah this is not a trolling motor it is an electric outboard yeah and there's a difference yeah 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 there, so luckily i didn't damage anything nothing was broken but no, you were good that besides little, my pride but yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and i don't know if you i don't know if you know this or not but I know, it was pretty, dude it was, it was, pretty, was and then oh so this was the best part of the story i look over and jeffrey who was our filmer is like fully on the whole thing dude everything is on camera and i'm like oh my god uh -huh. this is horrid that and that was the start of our fishing day but it was an epic day. It was it a was, fun day. It ended up just like an awesome, awesome couple of days of fishing. But uh, so at, after that day, Jeffrey said, yeah, it was so funny because Nate, he's like, I think Nate forgot he was mic'd up. And the whole day he he's was, like, the whole day he was talking to himself oh, about, no. about, oh man, I shouldn't have done that. I, wanna, I shouldn't oh, have, yeah. <laughs> and it just, just reflecting on every 10 minutes, he'd be like, flashback to this dude incident. i was like he was no. beating himself up over it and oh I, bro and so it jeffrey was, was like oh man i feel bad for nate he was kind of beating himself up over it and i think he forgot he was mic'd up <laughs> but but no you crushed <laughs> i think you, I, I would i would forget i'm mic'd and then i'd look down and be like yeah. oh no and then i would be like yeah <laughs> you crushed i was it hoping that, that i was like we i was super away. grateful to have you on on that shoot because you know you're you're so you're so well put together on camera and mm -hmm. you know what you're doing. And I thought this is like a perfect personality for this situation. This 12 foot Gregor aluminum, this little electric outboard, but going back to, to the learning curve, it is a little tricky. If you have experience with gas outboards, you have these, these audible cues with a gas outboard you know you turn the handle and you can hear it rev up that slowly ramps up and you have these you don't think about it when you're using the motor but you have these little little audible cues that you kind of go off of um and uh you don't get that with the electric motor it's literally silent so you just kind of like when i demo these things for people i always tell them just just kind of like ease into the throttle feather it and i yeah. say it i say it like five times because people don't <laughs> believe me just ease into the throttle just get comfortable with it you know like take 10 minutes and just go slow mm -hmm. go from forward shift into neutral and back into reverse and then back forward again and and just just like take 10 minutes and just do that trust me and then after that have fun you well, know. I think there's a stigma, too, that's going away, you know, as we see more and more electric cars hit the road that, man, these things have torque and they have power. Yeah. And when people, you know, historically have thought of, like, electric engines, like, oh, no way this thing can, like, move me at all. And, like, they're powerful. Yeah. They um, are. Case in point, you know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, being able to, I mean, whether you're saving fuel money or just, um, you know, just at, from the convenience of it, like... Being able to go fish the bay for a day and just bring your like electric tiller like that's huge dude well yeah we we've we really value this like portability aspect you know you carry your yeah. motor in one hand your battery in the other hand down to the ramp ramp or the launch pop it in your boat pop the motor onto the bracket and and you go and these brushless motors there's no gearing or anything it's so there's nothing to corrode bind up all this stuff it it's really like truly maintenance free i mean of course you want to rinse off the components especially after in the you salt. use it in the yeah. salt so so it doesn't rust but but there's very very little maintenance no filter changes no oil changes no gearing to get gummed up or corrode like it's it's pretty pretty slick and you know 
uh, one good thing about our motors is that you can run them off of whatever battery power you have access to or can afford. We offer high-end Bluetooth lithium batteries, but you can run it, you can run all of our motors off of a deep cycle lead acid battery for 120 bucks at Costco. So if you if you just want to get into this motorized kayak or small vessel fishing game because you want to get off the bank or you want to go a little bit farther or you want to make sure you can go out and then come back safely like you can save some money get into this thing for a thousand bucks and 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 then you know invest in that high-end battery later down the road or mm -hmm. more battery power to increase your range even more um, and you know when when Newport first came out there was this kind of this this kind of perception that it was this knockoff brand there wasn't really a, a solid brand foundation behind Newport um, it it wasn't a knockoff at all it's ha just so happens to be there's kind of there was some off-the-shelf components there's this also kind of you know what's done what's been done it takes some true innovative like resources behind it to make it different but it's been done pretty well like you know our main competitor is a German brand who's been doing this for a lot of years and I think they optimized a lot of it now we have resources behind true innovation and truly driving the brand and the product forward and we are like don't confuse Newport with a knockoff like we're on our own freaking path forward in into offering this complete fishing solution and I don't care what the competitors do higher you know high-end competitors low-end competitors like we are truly on a path of designing the best small watercraft fishing experience that that is our goal like I've never I wouldn't be at Newport you know with the background and the foundation and fishing I have I wouldn't be at Newport if that wasn't the case mm -hmm. I want to lead and like continue to be a progressive driving force in this small boat fishing movement. This is, it's like, this really truly is kind of the evolution of, there's this cycle that anglers go through, bank, boat, bigger boat, bigger boat, <laughs> back to the big boat, <laughs> back to, to the, the kayak, boat. to yeah. the, to the skiff, to the kayak. <laughs> And it's really just a convenience, portability, like maintenance-free, mm -hmm. worry-free experience. And you get this whole aspect of being tied to nature. Like, you know, so so just, and I think, you know, I don't know. It's it's just uh, like being a, being a driving force in the progression of this micro-skiff kayak movement. Like, it's not done, and we're going to continue to make it go beyond where it's at now. I don't even think it's close to being done. Yeah, like it's anything still else, fresh. everything is constantly evolving, as it has to with these totally. fisheries and totally. accessibility. And, and we talk a lot on this podcast about, you know, the next generation of fishermen, like your, 18, your average 18-year-old, like obviously is not going to have money to go and buy a skiff, you know? And um, if there's other ways for them to access fishing, like we're going to do it. And I was surprised um, the first time that I looked up like the price points on Newport's electric outboards and and your trolling motors like it's really really reasonable yeah. and and for you know a young a young person to be able to kind of just get into fishing whether it's on a, a kayak or a, or an inflatable is just it's huge to to give opportunity to those people who might otherwise you know not only be able to shore pound which is great you know we all have our roots in shore pounding but it's nice oh, to it's nice to get off of the uh, oh yeah, you're always when you're fishing from the bank, you're always looking and thinking about what what exactly. can I do next. Like, oh, I look over there. Like, damn, I can't cast over there. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's a natural progression, and and it's a pretty like it makes it attainable and accessible mm -hmm. for these kids who are fired up to go fishing. Mm -hmm. And that's that's like we need to we need to keep fueling that because I mean I, I don't know I I go back to a lot in re like recent days. Fishing's cool when when I was a kid, like nobody cared about, nobody cared that you liked to go fishing. There wasn't this, this passionate, like young culture around fishing. Mm -hmm. Fishing's cool, dude. Everybody wants to 
know how to fish and wants to know somebody that's their ticket to like getting them on the water. And yeah, it's, I, I love the accessibility factor that, that we're offering and, and at the price points we're like, you know, virtually close to half of the retail price of some of the other competitors. And honestly, our product is better. So we're just set up for, I, I mean, I can speak to this too. He's, he's behind the lens here, but um, watching you, you know, watching the um, NK 180, right? The yeah, pro? The one, NK 180 Pro uh, is the new one that's coming out. Watching that in action, like without the pedaling, you were moving, and then when you were pedaling, like, dude, that guy is like, that guy's covering more ground than he needs to. He's going faster than he needs to, <laughs> but it's really totally. impressive, and it's silent. You know, like we have the underwater shots, and um, the thing's so damn quiet, and 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 you really like. Not you weren't on plane, but dude, you were you had a and that's a big kayak too that you were on, you know, and and a pretty little motor, yeah. Like when when we made the improvements over the original NK180 to this NK180 Pro, we were able to achieve 16% higher top end throttle, 25% more efficiency in this tiny little package. And you know, we changed some of the geometry and the pitch of the prop a little bit and stuff, but you know, the reality is, is when you're fishing and when you're fishing La Jolla or a freshwater body, you, you don't really, you don't need to go that far mm -hmm. before you start looking. And when you're fishing, like even in my boat, in a, doesn't matter a 60 foot yacht or a 12 foot kayak, when you're actually fishing, you don't need to go faster than six miles an hour or six knots. <clears throat> number one your sonar is not going to work yeah. as good and number two like if you go faster than that you're missing everything anyway mm -hmm. so you're just super effective and quiet and more capable of just bigger stuff so i i, I know you you definitely have some plans to get all these new products out and um one of the big things is like being able to travel with it because of the size and the weight you know the the convenience and um I know you already mentioned like catching a cow, which I'm very keen to see. I can't wait. I want to do that. <laughs> um, but like, I know you have a lot of uh, experience down in Baja too. And, and even for, uh, you know, some sort of trip like that, like what's, what are your plans for 2024 with all these new products? Oh man. I mean, <clears throat> you know, outside of West coast stuff, you know, our main <clears throat> markets are Southeast, Northeast, like striper guys southeast everything from redfish to trout to tarpon sailfish blackfin um and then the big chunk is the bass fishery in the yeah. middle of the country mm -hmm. the biggest geographic piece and then west coast you know and baja like i think it'd just be so badass to go down to gonzaga and like hit those islands be at those islands in an hour with the kayak motor and just go crush on cabria and sierra and yellows and stuff and i feel like that <clears throat> i feel like the coastline inside it well i don't know if i'd say that i've caught some big cabria like in there and and decent yellows and stuff but i think for the most part that's kind of like nursery fishery a little bit mm -hmm. out at the islands you get a little it just seems like everything's a little bigger so that would be like ultimate ultimate Baja trip would be Gonzaga Bay, getting to those islands, fishing bigger yellows, Sierra Cabrillo and stuff. Yeah, you know, from you the... going in a month, I am <laughs> going gotta, in a month, and I demo. just fired up. Y'all hit you up, Howie. Get you a motor. Get, yeah. get, yeah. Boy, get out there on the <laughs> kayak, catch some yellows. It'd be sick. But, I think there's something so cool though about just like being in a 20 year old kayak. Just yeah. Having, uh, it's so cool, but you know, <laughs> the the part about the um, the electric outboards that I thought was really cool was that, and especially this really plays into bay fishing or freshwater fishing when you're on really quiet bodies of water that aren't aren't that big. You're able to kind of get a two in one where your outboard can also act as a very quiet trolling motor, totally. Which right now is is an extra purchase that these guys got to do. So and yeah, and you that don't to me was the coolest thing about fishing on the bay with it is that I could use it. You know, you can go super slow and super quiet, or you could, you know, go to full and get to where you wanted to go. Yeah, that's one of the advantages of, of our motors for sure is, you know, a traditional like uh, value priced trolling motor with a tiller on it 
clicks. It's got like five mm -hmm. click positions. That's cool for a trolling motor, but you're right. The outboard doubles as a trolling motor and the outboard because you have, you get performance from 1%, literally 1%, 1%. which is like yeah. a crawl to top end speed, which is, you know, six or seven knots depending on conditions and all that stuff. But, but yeah, you, you really need, you, it's really one tool for the job. Yeah, I know exactly. So, sorry. but going back to Gonzaga, so I'm going in a month. <laughs> I've never been there before. I've driven by. What are your tips? Is there is there something I should be fishing with? Is there a type of technique? Is there a fishery there that is better than other places? All what you, about Gonzaga is cool? All you need is Alexa 400, a heavy inshore rod, yep. and a handful of SP minnows. Honestly, that's... Alexa 400 is the biggest reel you want. Yeah. That, that's it. Yeah. It's the most. <laughs> Although, if you're gonna go down there and drop baby yellowtail to the bottom on reefs and do serious grouper fishing uh -huh. take a fathom 40 and a rail rod and be ready really but yeah <laughs> but but if you're just wanting to make a thousand casts in a day and catch surface stuff all you need is a bait cat like a heavy calico bass setup and okay. a box full of sp minnows that's it because and okay. just cast into the rocks and be ready to pull hard dude like, yeah i don't like button your drag and, and pull yeah i don't yeah. i don't uh recommend fishing with anything but a locked drag because hell yeah okay <laughs> you just, i'm good with that can't. and it's mostly like that initial 10 speaking like Getting to the leopard grouper fishing it's that totally. it's the initial like 10 seconds totally know? and not giving up too yeah like you know cabria are kind of notorious for they hit like a freight train they take you straight into the rocks but if you get them out of that you know, and continue to pull them toward the boat, they kind of give up. <clears throat> Trout, okay. Trout had a good story. He's like, yeah, you know, we were fishing these, because I'm sure you've seen it, like, occasionally you'll see, I don't know, like anywhere from 20 to, like, 70 plus fish in you know a 10 square foot area just start like foaming uh -huh. really on the oh, yeah. micro cabrias oh yeah or i've Cabria. seen them come up on big mullet too yeah and then you'll see you know the odd golden and you're like, oh i want to catch that one <laughs> but he was talking like yeah we kept he was, he was in his kayak with his buddies and like yeah we kept getting broken off and finally like we fish i fish 65 pound braid to an 80 pound you know um three foot leader like uh, some some guys fish uh, leaders and yeah stuff. some guys fish yeah. like the steel you know like yeah. wahoo leaders so you're not fishing deep nothing is nothing is you deep. can catch cabria you can catch cabria like out on the pinnacles and stuff but for the stuff that i think howie's talking about you know like that skinny water is what's the most exhilarating it's so clear That's like so clear cool. water and you're casting up you're casting into three feet of water and then working it out away from the mm -hmm. rocks or or kind of diagonally parallel sort of to the rocks and getting bit you know these things are coming from the bottom in 12 or 15 feet of water and just smoking stuff on the surface and i don't even mean to keep like circling back to kayaks but one of the big things that the pongaros are huge on is if you get too tight to the rocks like that fish is going to get spooked you're not going to get as many bites yeah and like maybe that's where you know like a smaller watercraft comes in that's stealthy oh 100%. And you can get because sometimes dude totally I mean, you know, it, it blows down there. You already talked about it. Like yeah. it's blown and it'll be blown like 20, you know, from, from the, uh, from the West and we're casting straight into the wind. And I'm just like, dude, I, I, as much as I am trying, like I can't get the bait where it needs to be cause it's fucking so windy. Um, and being able to get like a little bit tighter without, you know, spooking that fish is, is huge. That's one huge advantage to kayak fishing too. And like, I mean, this could go on for hours, yeah. but, <clears throat> but but sea bassing, like you can't, you cannot fish sea bass in the kelp in a boat the same way. I mean, you can, but you cannot fish sea bass over the top of the kelp in a boat the same way you can in a kayak. You're just not ever going to be as stealthy. And that's why kayak guys <clears throat> knock them dead. Yeah. In, in like when that stuff's biting in the spring over the kelp, the kayak guys have the edge for sure. I remember my summer job when I was going to school at USD was uh, I worked at La Jolla Kayak. And most of my day was spent watching the kayak guys come in and going over and talking to them like, yeah, you know, I got like a 40 pound sea bass and a couple yellows today. And they're back by like 2 p.m. Like, oh, man, that's the dream. And then I talked to my buddy who was out on a skiff and he's like, yeah, you know, we didn't catch shit. It's just, <laughs> yeah, it's just harder to get in there and uh, 
yeah, you're a little not not as stealthy and yeah and you guys are dedicated i mean you talk about like all the accessories you can put on a kayak you can make it as as intricate as you want or as simple as you want and and you know all you really need is a paddle and a kayak but if you want to you know maximize your opportunity and give yourself the best shot of catching that fish like if you're spending the money on a nice kayak like you might as well spend the money on all the accessories to go with it exactly the the whole kayak thing the whole kayak experience is kind of chasing that equivalent that experience that's equivalent to what you can do on a on a power boat mm -hmm. you know yes but you're and not so, on a power boat and that's yeah. the kind of draw of it yeah and getting back to the whole sea bassing thing so that brings me up there's this <laughs> guy down in uh cedros island um jeff jeff yeah dude He's a legend. I was able to talk with him, and it's so cool that he has perfected this Cedros Island sea bass fishing all around kayaks because you got to go deep into those kelp beds there and drop in this little hole, mm -hmm. right? And there's no way you'd be able to get in there with a ponga. The fish would be spooked yeah. you know, when you're 100 yards away. Yeah, so mean, it's so cool that you you take this little, little vessel and you get into the coolest little pockets or nooks or whatever, and, dude, you pull out a... 60 70 pound sea bass yeah this guy's got them wired yeah yeah i mean not to give away too many secrets but you can do that <laughs> around here like that's mm -hmm. the absolutely that's where that whole thing came from yep <clears throat> so yeah it's you know i i just do that it's there's so many so many possibilities and so much adventure to be experienced on kayaks and yeah that's like as newport that's the whole whole thing that that we're we want to fuel you know S go farther stay out longer reach water you weren't able to reach before get back safe and uh that's what that's why i'm in this business you know so yeah man and i think you guys have been doing a great job just the exposure of the brand and the education about all the products you know just making people aware of like this um technology and all these innovations are are available to them yeah and you know. we're 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 ang we're passionate anglers you that's know? the other and thing. that's the that's the one kind of magic ingredient that that we have going on at newport is that we are actual real anglers and you know taking into consideration all this tons of feedback we get from all these different communities and trying to put it into to a product that satisfies this core hardcore group of of anglers that that has these big goals in mind and wants to experience this adventure you know like w all that stuff resonates with us and and then we take all that stuff and turn it into products that are are useful and that appeal to to the fishing community so that that's you know a lot of times as you lot a lot of a lot of companies a lot of brands have a lot of influence that is not drawn from true fishing experience from people that are passionate about fishing and yeah i think that's like one magic ingredient that we have at newport is you know people like myself and the people we work with like we we live this lifestyle that we're creating products for and it makes a huge difference yeah, Absolutely. that can't be understated when you're all. on the water doing the actual product <laughs> testing yeah. and you are designing it not only for the consumer but for yourself it's a huge difference yeah yeah um moving on just because i'm curious before we have to wrap things up i'm excited to hear about like what are you most looking forward to this upcoming season newport related or not like i'm um you know obviously we're all hoping this bluefin sticks around but like is it a is it a destination place i know you and i talked briefly about um you know, a, a big bucket list trip of going to catch like, like kingfish. Australia, and, yeah, Australia. Yeah, man. New that's, Zealand. yeah. What at those some guys point, do I got to do it. <laughs> yeah, what those guys do off the rocks is just epic. I, my mind a lot of times goes straight to like, imagine if you were approaching it from the other side, what it would be like. It'd be insane. So that's on the bucket list. I don't know about for 24, but you never know. But, uh, I think, I think just, uh, you know, I, I've been kind of light on my La Jolla kayak fishing the mm -hmm. last season. We have you such know, a badass skiff. <laughs> you know, when, when I when I was uh, 
2019, 2018, 2019, when we launched the, when I was working for Hobie and we launched the new Outback, I was fishing La Jolla so much. Like even in the summertime after work, I'd book it down to, down to the shores, launch my kayak and fish the evening bite, which is honestly probably the only time worth fishing at La Jolla uh, <laughs> for yellows. But but I'd bomb down there two or three days a week and fish the evening bite. And you just, I mean, you know what it's like when you're on the water every day or almost every day. Like you get this intuitive kind of like, you know where there's going to be fish at what tide, what time of day. Like you, your confidence level just goes. And so, um, and I was in insane shape then because I was like, you know, on a full day of fishing, I'd be doing 15, 20 miles on the kayak. Jeez, and, jeez, Howie. Yeah. <laughs> Fully <laughs> manpower well, too. You're well, not, you, you don't gotta, have any engine. The thing about La Jolla is. <laughs> That's you, crazy. You have to cover. You got to cover. You got to cover mm-hmm. ground. Like sometimes you go out. Perfect example. One of my first, when I first got into kayak fishing, I was out late the night before having a good time woke up at 9 30 i'm like yeah i'm gonna go fish la jolla launched at 11 30 within 10 minutes of the launch i just cleared the reserve line and i see these just big monster yellows just kind of splashing around like right in the cove right there i put two fish on the boat about 40 pounders jeez (laughs) come in load up in my truck i'm on the way home by 12 30. no way sometimes it's like that once in every five years yeah it's about to say uh but you know so so i i for 20 this year i would love to spend a little more time dedicate a little more time to just grinding out that local yellowtail fishing in la jolla specifically la jolla um and then like looking forward to 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 some consumer trade shows you know we're gonna have a little presence at bassmaster expo that's in the spring we're gonna do icast we'll have a big booth at icast so that's like a big industry-wide party super fun everybody (laughs) gets to kind of reunite after a whole year of not seeing each other just talking to each other over email or video call or something everybody come comes together and it's this whole industry thing like you leave icast with this this intense motivation to like what's okay what like what's our path forward you know you have all these plans on how to fix every possible issue the fishing industry is experiencing and so that's that's a fun event and then fort lauderdale boat show so a little little more into shows this year and then i don't know man i always look forward to icast it's a grind and you come home completely wiped at the end of oh, it. All but, the trade shows are like that. Yeah. But um, they're fun. They're so much fun. But I'm looking forward to iCast this year because it's going to be an exciting iCast. We've got some some awesome stuff coming down the pipe for iCast. And oh, yeah. just, just keep an eye on it because around May, between May and like July timeframe when iCast is, that's going to be a real exciting time of year for us at Newport. Cool. Yeah. We'll be there. I will be, we'll be there interviewing you. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'll be there. What about you, Nate? My plans for the year? No, what do you what do you Book most it up. What? fishing? What are you most looking forward to? Uh, I'm, I'm glad you didn't say on. anything about bluefin too. <laughs> no, I, well, I'm about to say something about bluefin. I want to get into it like a <laughs> solid foamer bite. That's kind of my my goal of the year. Um, in terms of species or whatever, not really. I have a I have an eight day trip planned. Which is going to be really fun. That's going to be in October. Oh. I do. I do a long range trip every year with my dad on the vagabond. On the vagabond. And yeah, last year we did a, a six day in August, which was Alitos? super fun. Or, we don't no. know. I mean, it's, you know, but, but last year. Oh, last year we did Ridge, oh. and it was dude. It was wide. Yeah. It was like that's rad. It was so much fun. the The highlight of that trip was slow pitching for yellowtail. Because, like, you think on slow pitching for rod. dude. It's on the noodle <laughs> rod, but usually you think of like you know might get one bite. It was instant you literally get to the bottom and you have to like start burning up your lure because if you get bit too close to the bottom you're gonna get rocked so Why it was can't yellowtail was fishing thick. here be like dude that? it's different they're like meanwhile it's species, been man. wide open in san Catine <laughs> yeah. for the past three months so you know Ugh. so a bluefin on the foamer on the popper would be great a wahoo would be amazing and um and i'm also going to be doing some freshwater trips this year i want to catch a big striped bass and a smallmouth nice those are my goals so where are you gonna go for the striper lake mojave yeah yeah i already did like a little recon trip like two weeks ago to a little shore pounding mission looks gorgeous 
the accommodations at, at Lake Mojave look great. Go to Catherine's Landing. I got a little boat so I can launch out there. And yeah, uh, your I saw these. Perfect for that. Yeah, yes. and I saw these guys filleting this <clears throat> limit of like 12, 15 pound stripers. Dude, they 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 got it good. So <laughs> I'm down. I I think I'm gonna plan that like in a month or so. That's and then that's Gonzaga right Bay too. That's, yeah. Are you gonna yeah. kill them all? What's up? Oh hell yeah, dude. <laughs> hell yeah. <laughs> Really there was nothing so, on the lawn, dude. Everything comes home. It's a meat fishing boat, doggy. So, yeah, really good. Gaffing them, too. So, Straight so, up, bring the gaff out on the lake. SoCal style. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Oh, man. So, real quick, one last story. Backtracking a little bit to Gonzaga. Uh, so, when we go down there, we camp at Papa Fernandez. And, you know, those guys, like, those people are so sweet the people that run that operation down there best burritos ever oh i but i don't know about that there's a lot of good burritos in mexico yeah that's true well i'll have to try it i've never but, tried but it. Can't tell. but you got to sit down at the restaurant there and eat one night if you're ever down there but but the best part about that whole adventure is keeping a couple sierra keeping a corvina and just like grilling them over the open flame yeah dude campfire and then for dessert you go down and you turn over rocks until you've got a nice couple <laughs> octopus and then you bring those back and you have those for dessert what and what's the tequila what's... of choice <laughs> yeah right <laughs> what's the drink whatever, of choice <laughs> whatever's in hand but you t- like rocks in the shallows you find octopus in them mm-hmm. what do you do with the octopus then eats it just straight up eats it. Well, yeah. Well, you got to. How do you prepare them. the octopus? You got to kill them, and then you have to tenderize them, and then you put them over the fire and grill them, and eat them. And that's dessert. Well, it's just an extra little. <laughs> that's great. Little thing on top. Sierra is Live off so the land. good. Sierra is so good. It's so good. It's got this almost yellow. So I don't know if I could be getting off base here, but do you know how yellowtail have this almost piney taste to them? Sometimes Sierra have that. It's like a, I, maybe I'm crazy, or I'm like, my palate's screwed up or something. No, you've got but, a great palate. <laughs> but Sierra have this, like, piney kind of taste to them, which I think is great. But, yeah, you just, oh, my, you just, like, just gill and gut just them. Just gill gut over the fire. Over the fire, and you just go at it with a fork. And it's so Sierra good. Ceviche, dude, is one so of my favorites, good. too. That's, that reminds me. I was on a half-day boat when I was, like, 12. And my buddy. This is getting long. I sorry, sorry, I know. This is the last <laughs> little story. Um, you just you said piney in this mention it. So my buddy caught a, a tree fish, and I was very great, gullible. Great. And name. and he he says, hey, if you scratch its tail, it, <laughs> it smells, smells like, like pine. <laughs> so I was like, no way. So I like he does it, and he comes in, and he goes whack and smacks the shit out of me. And oh. I was like, you bastard. <laughs> and I've never forgotten about that. Yeah. Uh, did it smell like fine? No, not even a little bit. Dude. <laughs> don't fall for that. Name. Yeah. Oh uh, well, cool, man. I'm excited for the year. I'm excited for you guys and to see yeah. uh, everything coming out. We have some projects in the works with Newport, so be on the lookout for that, and be on the lookout for uh, all the exciting things they have going on for iCast and the rest of the year here. Yeah, it was great working with your team and continuing to work with your team. You guys are are all stars. So. Likewise, man. It's been a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to more for sure. Absolutely. Thanks for coming down. Thanks for having me. Of course, anytime.